I'm just going to wait while somebody very important gets their seat. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen I have probably the easiest job of anybody this morning. I have two jobs actually. One is to welcome you to worship this morning. So welcome to Dennis Baptist Church this morning, whether you are here in person or whether you are online. The second job I have this morning is to encourage you to worship. And I'm thinking, it's Easter Sunday. How much encouragement to worship our God do you need? But anyway, here we go. Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 9. The Apostle John says this. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned round to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man dressed in a robe with a gold sash around his chest. His hair, the hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp, double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like dread, a, dread, a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Amen. What a vision of the risen Jesus for John. Uh, I was checking my facts this morning. Uh, John was 85 when he had this revelation of who Jesus was. He was exiled on Patmos, and he had been, despite his advanced years, he'd been subjected to beatings, to torture. Tradition says that he was put into a vat of burning oil and survived. John has the distinction of being the only one of the apostles to die in his bed. The only one of the apostles not to be martyred. Despite everything that happened to him, he died, as the Bible would say, an old man full of good years. And so this morning, I love the fact that when he had this vision of Jesus, he was so overwhelmed, it says that he fell down like a dead man. And what's Jesus' response? He says he put his hand on him and he told him, don't be afraid. So this morning... We are in the presence of that same Jesus. We don't have that wonderful visual sight of who Jesus is. But he is here today and we worship someone who has faced death and beaten it. And having done that, he offers that same hope, that same assurance to every one of us who puts our trust in him. That no matter what we go through, no matter whether life is good or bad, easy or hard, Jesus is with us. And his command is to trust in him and not to be afraid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. This is Easter Sunday and we share in your victory. We have not come here this morning to a memorial service. We have not come here this morning to pay tribute to a dead hero. We we. we are here today in the presence of the risen and victorious Jesus. 
And we thank you that there is going to come a day when we will see him with our own eyes. That we will see the nail prints in his hands and his feet. We will see the wounds in his side. But most of all, we will see the crown of victory on his head. And like John, we will fall down, not in fear, but in adoration and worship. And so we pray this morning that our time together would be a rehearsal, a preparation for that time when faith becomes sight, that we will give you our praise and our adoration, and most of all, our obedience, as we celebrate who you are and what you have done, as we declare that you were dead, that you are alive, that you are the living one, and that you live forever and ever, and you have the power over hell and death itself. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. morning. Let's stand together as we sing today. Sing a very appropriate song as we begin today. I was buried beneath my shame. You could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I met you. You 
verses to you about why we are celebrating what we're celebrating today. Why are we so joyful today? Matthew 28 starts off this way. The first two verses, it says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. And the angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here for he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and indeed he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So today we're going to sing a song that uh, simply says, I have seen the Lord. This is about the eyewitnesses' accounts. They have seen the Lord. And even the second verse even goes on to talk about how even us as followers of Jesus, though we've not physically seen him with our eyes, we have seen him work in our lives. We've seen him, his power be on display. And so let's sing this song of resurrection this morning together. I have seen the Lord. This is also going to be a time where we, we worship uh, through giving. So for those who would be, we call DBC their home church, this is a time for us to worship through giving. If you're a guest this morning, we invite you to let the bucket pass us by. Lamb of God. Light of heaven, laid in darkness for three days. But on the third, the tomb was empty. Hell has no victory, but he made a way. They saw him. They saw him die, but there he stood. He did exactly what he said he would. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, he is risen. Praise the one who saved my life. He's alive, I have seen the Lord. Seen his love. I've seen his love, his deep compassion, move the mountains of my shame. I've seen his power open the blind eyes, heal diseases, and break the chains. All oh, my hope. All of my hope is built on this. He is exactly who he says he is. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, he is risen. Praise the one who saved. seen the Lord, the one who gave his life for me. I have seen the Lord, the one who rose in victory. I have seen the Lord, he's reigning over everything. I have seen the Lord, I have seen alive I have seen 
Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Lord, thank you that it's not just a story to tell, it's not just a good thought to think, but the truth is, Jesus, that you did come and live and die and rise again. Thank you that we can celebrate that and have hope in that today. We can trust in that today. It is sure. It is true. 
And because it is true, we know that all these things that you have promised us are true. That all that you said about us and about yourself are true. That we have peace and hope and forgiveness and life. Those things are true because you conquered the grave. We rejoice in that today. So as we continue on this morning in our time of prayer, Lord, in our time in the word, may you stir our hearts. May you draw us nearer to you. Help us to see you as even bigger than we do right now in this moment. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This time, all of our primary, no, they're staying in today, sorry. <laughs> Premature, I'm <not> sorry. Good morning. morning. Happy Easter again. He is risen. risen. Uh, This morning is such a blessed uh, day for us. Uh, As we think about uh, all that Christ uh, is to us, the fact that he rose from the grave. And because of that, we can have life today and life in all its fullness. Uh, And it's such a joy just to see so many folk uh, here uh, as we worship with one voice and as we recognize all that God is to us. Uh, This morning, before we move into a time of prayer, we're going to have a time of prayer and then a time in God's Word. Before we do that, I just want to make you aware of what's happening within the life of the church. Um, So it should be up on the screen. As you can see, not a lot. Uh, So we have a picnic uh, after the service today. So you're more than welcome to to join us for that. Uh, We have extra food available. So if you haven't brought any food, um, then do still come with us. Uh, We have plenty of sandwiches. So it will be a good opportunity for us just to rejoice and, and continue the celebration of Easter. Uh, so that's at Alexandra Park, just up the road. So we'll, we'll go there after our, our time uh, together. Um, and Wednesday, we're going to be having a, a prayer walk. Uh, hopefully it will be dry. You can pray for that. Um, so that's at 7 o'clock up at Ridry. Uh, we're going to actually pray inside the building and pray in different places within the space. And then we're going to walk around Ridry and, and pray. And that will be from 7 o'clock. Uh, through to to 8 o'clock and there's no missional communities on this week because it's the first week uh, of the month Uh, we're back in our series in Ephesians uh, next Sunday so that's Ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 1 so that's basically the plan uh, for this week Uh, this morning uh, what we're going to do is take some time to pray Uh, and I thought we could just take some time to pray through the words of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 to 4 Uh, we're going to take these words And we're going to pray through these biblical truths uh, together uh, before we come to look in more depth at a different passage uh, as as a church family. So Peter is writing to the believers. These believers are are facing a a weight of of heavy trial. uh, um, And he encourages them with these words. So in the midst of, of a really difficult moment for this early church, Peter writes this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Uh, This morning, as we begin, we're going to take a moment to focus on what are three key words from these verses. Three words that, that Peter really emphasizes from 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, and verses 3 to 4. The first word is mercy. So let's just, for a moment, let's just hold on to that word mercy. Uh, as, we, as we begin our time of prayer together, uh, I want us to begin by seeing the mercy of God. The mercy of God. And as Peter tells us here, it is a great, a great, great mercy that has been shown to us. His mercy is most clearly demonstrated in the fact that he sent his son to rescue us from our sins. And as you fix your eyes upon the Father this morning, as you see his abundant mercy towards towards you and towards me, how do you respond to that? 
as you think about God as merciful, how do you respond? Peter shows us how we can respond and what happens in our hearts when we see how merciful he has been. Peter says that we should bless him. We should bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we bless him, we thank him. We, we thank God that he did not leave us in our own sin, to our own devices, in the midst of our own brokenness. As we bless him, we thank him. And as we bless him, we praise him. We praise him that we are now new creations. If we are in Christ, the old life is gone. Behold, the new has come. We are completely changed because of Jesus. So we bless him. We praise him. We thank him. And as we bless him, we give God the glory. So as you think about the small, detailed, daily mercies that you experience within your life, they all point to a greater mercy that we have in Christ. So all the, all the ways that God provides for us and helps us, all of that points to a greater good, that God is good, that God cares for us, that God loves us. So as a church family, let's just take a moment uh, to do that. Let us thank him, let us bless him, let us praise him for his mercy. Let's do that. So Father, we, we do praise you and we bless you today. We thank you that, that we can gather here together on Resurrection Sunday. And through your resurrection, we see your mercy. But Lord, we also recognize that in the midst of what has perhaps been a busy week, um, there are many things that are, are clouding our, our thoughts and our heart. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would just remove any distraction in our heart and mind that you would uh, lift us of, of anything that, that might be causing us to feel overwhelmed or burdened or weary. And Lord, help us by your spirit to see how merciful you have been. Help us to, to thank you for your mercy. Help us to praise you for your mercy. Help us to give you the glory because you have been so merciful to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So mercy is the first word. Uh, the second word is, is hope. Uh, we cannot help but connect the word hope with the event of the resurrection. Let me say that again. We cannot help but connect the word hope with the event of the resurrection. Christ through his resurrection becomes something precious to us. Um, he is what Peter describes here as our living hope. Jesus is our living hope. And what Peter means by that is that we experience something of his resurrection life. But this, this experience will be fully realized in that day where we see him face to face, something we've just been singing about. So this morning we want to pray that God by his spirit would fill us by his spirit today, that we would be filled to the fullness. And in fullness, we would live the life that he has called us to, a life in the spirit, a life in the power of the resurrection. For the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in you and lives in me. Praise God for that. Uh, so there is so much for us to be hopeful for. There is so much for us to be thankful for as we see what Christ has done. As we look at our circumstances, the complexity, the challenge of our circumstances, look beyond that and see Christ. See who he is. See that he has risen and embrace the fact that we have a living hope today. So let's pray. Let's pray for, for a fresh experience of God's hope. So Father, we, we pray that as we recognize you are our living hope, we pray that, that this would be something that's not just in our heads, something that we intellectually understand, but this would be something that is deep, deep within our hearts. It would not only be head knowledge, it would be heart knowledge, that by your spirit you would make this real to us, that we would be a people of hope, and that would be because you are our living hope. Help us, Lord, to see the fact that the tomb is empty. And as the tomb is empty, we can respond with, with hopeful lives. By your spirit, would you continue to, to be at work in us? Lord, we recognize that for some of us here today, we're carrying stuff, we're feeling overwhelmed. 
And Lord, we just want to take a moment to recognize that these things are real. These things are difficult. But your promise is that you will be with us in the midst of that. Lord, I thank you that you do not separate yourself from us. That you meet us where we are at. And in the midst of the challenge we face today, we can look to you as our living hope. Help us, Lord, to be hopeful. Help us to look beyond what we see and towards you and how good you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, mercy, hope. Final one is inheritance. Uh, Peter tells us that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So our inheritance in Christ, if we have faith in Christ, is absolutely guaranteed. Uh, and as we finish our time of prayer this morning, morning guys, uh, as we finish our time of prayer this morning, there's a few wee shuffles going on, so <laughs> keep going. Um, I, want, I want us to, to really pray and ask uh, that our lives would have eternal focus. So as we think about what it means to receive a wonderful inheritance, my prayer is that, that we would have a focus on that day to day, that we would be eternally minded men and women in Christ. Our primary focus, our first focus in this life would not be on money and possessions. It wouldn't even be in family and friends. It wouldn't be on achievement or success. It wouldn't be in pursuits and pleasures. It would be on this wonderful eternity that God has for us. We have an inheritance, a wonderful inheritance in Christ beyond comprehension. We have no idea. We have something of an idea of what it is God has planned for us. But rest assured, what God has planned for us will be incredible. And it's all a gift. We don't have to earn that. We simply receive in faith. This inheritance, this plan that God has for us, when we fix our eyes on it in Christ, is what will make the rest of our lives sense. What will make sense of the rest of our lives? Uh, as, we, as we think about uh, all that we face, we will have clarity and peace in our lives when we focus on eternity. So let's take some time to pray that beyond this Easter season, into the rest of 2024, we would be a people who are eternally minded. And as eternally minded people, we would give thanks for this inheritance that is ours if we have faith in Christ. So let's do that. And Lord, we're just uh, reminded again that uh, you call us to, to fix our eyes upon you as the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we, we thank you that not only do you change us today, and transform our lives and give us hope and joy and peace. But this is just a foretaste, this is just a sample of this wonderful, incredible plan that you have for us. So Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to see something of what you have planned. And Lord, I pray that in the midst of all the, the various distractions that we've talked about, we would focus, we would fix our eyes upon you, Jesus, and we would see this incredible inheritance this amazing gift that you have. And Lord, that would determine how it is we live today. And the words that we speak and the decisions we make and the feelings that we carry within our heart, Lord, help us to look to you and help us to see of how great your inheritance is and how ultimately it's all about you and it's all about you at work in us so that you might be glorified in and through us. We have a wonderful inheritance, Jesus, and we thank you for this incredible gift. Help us to fully receive that by faith. So we ask that you would bless us now as we move on, Lord, and as we take time to focus on your word. We pray that by your spirit you would take hold of what it is we have to look at today, that you would shape us and mold us and make us more into your image. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, uh, we've taken time uh, this morning uh, to ask that God by his spirit would strengthen our hearts as we take time to reflect on the resurrection from 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, that we would be increasingly courageous and confident as we come to terms with all that the resurrection means to us. Uh, this morning, I'm going to take a few moments now 
uh, basically to do that again. Uh, and we're going to focus on two passages of Scripture. Uh, the first one is Luke's Gospel. It's a continuation of what we looked at together on Good Friday. Um, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as well and different, different verses uh, from that chapter. So let's have a look together at what it is that Luke writes as he tells the story of Jesus and his resurrection. So Luke chapter 24, we read these words. Luke tells a story. He says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Amen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise in the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Amen. And what I've just read to you this morning is the greatest turnaround in all of history. Uh, these disciples were scattered. They were discouraged. They were confused because they were utterly convinced that Jesus was dead. Full stop. But the resurrection changed everything. And what they experience uh, leads to wonder, awe, amazement at what God had done and what God was doing in their midst. And as we take time to ponder and reflect on the resurrection event this morning, take stock of what it means. Uh, I want you to see that you can come to no other conclusion apart from the one that says that God is in the business of complete transformation. For any one of us who's in Christ this morning, this is your testimony, is it not? Uh, think about who you were before Christ. Think about who you are now after Christ. Is it not the case that you have been completely changed? Amen. 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 And is it not the case that the reason for why your life has been completely changed is because of the resurrection and because of his resurrection power within us. I think for many of us this morning, we know this is all true, but we also feel the weight of the brokenness of our world. We see it all around us in our own lives and throughout the world. We see how things are within the world. We see how things ought to be. And we find it difficult to know how to manage all of that in our hearts. So we have an idea of how the world should be, but we see reality and we find it difficult just to accommodate all that's going on. And as I've been reflecting on that particular conflict this morning, I take great encouragement from the fact that what I find in Scripture is what I find in the world. The Bible is very honest about the brokenness of our world and of our lives. And we see that reflected in our world and in our lives. The challenges, the difficulties, the suffering, the pain we find in Scripture is a picture of the challenges, the difficulties, the suffering, the pain in our ordinary day-to-day -day lives. We all recognize that. I hope we all recognize that today. The resurrection is the answer to that. It is the only answer to whatever problems we are facing. Maybe you're not convinced by that this morning. Let me show you five areas that point to the fact that the resurrection is a very clear answer to the difficulties and challenges that we experience in our lives. And especially as we think about the difficulties and worries that these areas that I'm going to look at bring into our lives and cause us to no longer have peace, cause us to worry, cause us to be full of fear. The first area I want us to focus on is relationships. Relationships. I think this morning about relationships, we can all... It, we can all testify and bear witness 
to the experience of broken relationships. Uh, sometimes that can be between us and God. Um, often that is between us and other people, family, friends, work colleagues. Uh, we look at our world. Uh, we see how much division there is politically, racially, nationally. One of the fruits of the fall is a breakdown of relationship. And we see it everywhere. We see it everywhere. It's a constant reality of our world. And it has always been constant wherever sin has been. And I want us to see this morning that the resurrection has an answer to that problem of broken relationships. Uh, think about these disciples for a moment. They were scattered. They were confused. Most likely they had different opinions about what had happened and what to do next. There was division amongst the disciples. But it's the resurrection that brings them together as a people. And we actually read that this is one of the fruits at the end of Luke chapter 24. After Jesus' ascension, Luke tells us the response of his disciples. Luke says, after worshipping him, that's Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. They were one. They were together because of the resurrection, because of his ascension. And as we gather here this morning on Resurrection Sunday, I'm looking out and I recognize this morning we are all so very, very different. Amen. We are all very different. Uh, we are different in personality. We're different in our backgrounds, in our nationality, in our interests, in our life experiences. Society, and most importantly, us within ourselves, we would not put us together uh, as a group of people. But it's the resurrection that we have a common bond in. We are here together as a whole mix of different people from different backgrounds and life experiences. And the commonality we have is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So praise God for that. That is a tremendous gift that we have. This moment in Denison within this community is very unique because we are so varied and yet we are one in him. So relationship, the resurrection speaks into that. It speaks into that brokenness that exists. And number two, second area the resurrection speaks into is, is sin. Think for a moment about sin. Think about your own sin. Think about the ways in which you fall short day to day. You know what you should do and yet you don't do it. That's my testimony. I sin every day. I fall short every day, every week, every month. So we can all agree this morning that sin is an all-pervasive thing within our lives. It's a constant battle. Sin is everywhere. We find it lurking in our minds like a fungus. We find it when it comes to desire within our heart. We see it in our actions. We see it with what we say. I think we can all testify to moments where we sin and we end up saying to ourselves, where did that come from? The reality is it came from within. Sin begins in here. It was in our hearts and we have allowed sin to influence our lives. And take encouragement this morning. The resurrection solves the problem of sin. And we can say this with confidence because of what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17. Paul says this, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised. But the fact of the matter is Christ has been raised. And our faith is of tremendous value and tremendous worth. And we therefore are no longer in our sins today. So rejoice in the fact that the answer to this problem of sin is the beauty and the power of Christ's resurrection. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise God for that. So in the midst of your challenge, your temptation, when you look back on a, on a day, any given day, and you see how you've sinned, cling to the resurrection. Cling to that promise that Jesus has defeated that sin on the cross. And through the resurrection, you can overcome. You have overcome in Christ. That's the second area, sin. Relationship, sin. The third area is death. <coughs> this morning, 
I invite you to reflect on the reality of death. It's a reality that we will all face one day. The statistics are clear. One in one die. The separation that comes from death, the loss we experience, the pain in our hearts as those we know and love are no longer with us. It's all very real to us. Death is everywhere. And praise God today, the resurrection has a clear answer to that problem of death. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 25, he says, For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. One of the greatest privileges of my life is to support families when their loved ones have passed away. Uh, to walk with them in that season of loss. To lead them as they gather for an occasion to commemorate someone's life. And I'm always encouraged, sometimes even amazed, at how incredibly hopeful some people are when it comes to the passing of those they love. The reality is, the resurrection has the last word in death. And for those of us in Christ, this brings tremendous, a tsunami of encouragement to our hearts and our minds. And what a witness that is, as we think about those we know who have known the Lord and who have passed away. And as we think that our response in, in that moment, yes, we experience loss and we mourn, but we are also significantly hopeful because we are with the Lord. I don't know if you've ever been to a humanist funeral service before. Honestly, no exaggeration, it is the most depressing thing you will do in your life. It says nothing, it means nothing, and it helps no one. Praise God we have a living hope. And the problem and pain of death, yes, it will have its moment in our lives. But it will be conquered by the power and the beauty of the resurrection. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to rejoice in. So even in the midst of loss, we can rejoice. And we can give thanks that those we love who have loved the Lord are now with him for eternity. So the resurrection has a word on death, the last enemy. The resurrection also has a word on life. And this morning, I also invite you to take a moment to take stock of life itself and take a moment to look at your own life. There are so many people in our society that are, are distracted, including some believers, uh, with things and with stuff that carries no eternal value. Uh, we are a society that is consumed by the things of the world. Uh, we find ourselves worshipping entertainment, comfort, food, material things, security, alcohol, drugs, even good things we turn into God things. But the Apostle Paul, here in 1 Corinthians 15, he examples a very different way of living. One that's marked by a view of Christ and his resurrection. So 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 30 to 32, we read this. Why are we in danger every hour? I face death every day. This is Paul speaking. As surely as I may boast about you, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do to me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul's point here is, what is the point of me living a life for Christ? That, in, that, that will involve sacrifice and hardship if Christ himself has not been resurrected. That's Paul's main point in this section. Paul knew that the resurrection was true. He had experienced its power firsthand. He was an eyewitness testimony to the, to the risen Jesus. He saw the risen Jesus himself. And so because of all of that for Paul, he could live the way he, he lived and it's something of what he describes here in 1 Corinthians 15. To live is Christ. To die is gain. As you think about your life, and as you think about all the varied things that you need to do within your life, both the big and the small, and as you think about how it is you should do those things, 
my invitation to you is to look at all of your life through the lens of the resurrection. And I invite yourself to ask the question, if the resurrection is true, then how should I do this? How should I do that? How should I do this thing and that thing? What should I say in this moment? How should I respond in this situation if the resurrection is true? Examine the totality of your life through the lens of the resurrection. I want us to understand, Denison Baptist Church, the resurrection not only changes death, but it changes our lives today, right now. Praise God for that. The final area is the future. So I invite you to take stock of the future itself. What it is that lies ahead of you, both in this life and in the life to come. And this is something that, that so many of us find ourselves consumed by, overwhelmed by. We look ahead to the future and we ask the question, what if? What's going to happen? Uncertainty can breed anxiety and fear. Without question, our worries about the future and what might happen in the future has a detrimental effect on your present. We are a society, we are a people who have never been more worried about the future. We see the news, we see the possibilities that are before us and we can be gripped by fear and uncertainty. And it's a resurrection that changes how as we view the future. We can be absolutely confident of that this morning. And I say that with absolute certainty because of what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 50, he says this. What, am I, what I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is, is a law, but thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you think about the resurrection, rest in these words this morning. Meditate on these words this week. Your future is secure because the resurrection has made your residency in heaven secure. And your future body will be nothing like what it is you currently have. And I know deep down you're saying amen to that. Praise God for that. Praise God for his wonderful provision. Think about this from a basic life sense. If you know something is going to work out and you're confident it's going to work out, it changes who you are in the present. You have more peace without question. But if you're unsure something's going to work out, if you're full of worry about a particular outcome, it has an impact on who you are in the present. So let the certainty of the resurrection inform the certainty of your future and let the love and the mercy and the grace of God in Christ be how you look forward in every single detail of your lives in the present. So five areas that the resurrection has a clear answer to. Relationships, sin, death, life and the future. Jesus offers you the gift of resurrection through relationship with him today. And I wonder this morning, have you received that gift? Have you received the gift of a relationship with Jesus? Have you said yes to him and no to your sin? No to the life that you've lived? Have you put Jesus at the very center of your life? We're going to respond in various ways. First of all, if you would like prayer for, for anything that's going on within your life, if you've been challenged by anything that has been said or anything we've sang about, then do speak to myself or TG or someone you know who loves the Lord and we would count it a privilege to just to hear what's going on and to pray for you if you would like prayer. Uh, maybe you would like prayer uh, for healing. Uh, maybe there's something that, that you're struggling with physically. Then we would take a moment to pray and ask that God would be at work 
according to his sovereign plan and purpose. And as a church, uh, we are here for you. Uh, we want to encourage you. Um, so if you're feeling discouraged, overwhelmed by something currently, then there's space after our time today uh, to receive prayer and support and direction. Uh, this morning, we also come to the table. Uh, and as we come to the table, we do so because we have resurrection life. Uh, the cross of Christ paves a way for the empty tomb. So as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, we're thanking him for the new life that we have. This table is for anyone who professes faith in Christ. And, and for anyone who's not sure, for anyone who's still on a journey of faith, we would encourage you not to take from this table, but to observe and to ask that God would continue to work in your life. Um, as believers, for those of us who are in Christ, let me encourage you this morning. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. And Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. For as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, what are we doing, Denison Baptist Church? We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. And Jesus will one day return because Jesus has already risen from the grave. On that day, our mortal bodies will become immortal bodies. So what a wonderful future ahead of us. What a gift this day is to us. All that it represents. So I encourage you to respond in these various ways. As we sing, as we take the bread and the cup, as we have fellowship afterwards, as we encourage and pray for one another, as we enjoy a picnic later on, may God bless you, may God be with you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this, this incredible day, Lord. We, we thank you that as we have taken time to, to really focus our hearts and minds on what the resurrection signifies, Lord, I pray that we would fully appreciate all that it means. We pray that you would, you would continue to convict us of the areas in our lives where we have not put the resurrection at the very center of. Help us to see the ways in which we have fallen short. And by your grace, help us to respond in faith, to address these challenges and these issues with faith and confidence that you will take hold of what it is we face. And through your resurrection power, you will change our hearts and minds and you will give us the strength to be the people you call us to be. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray now that as we move into a time of response, that you would be at work in a very clear and powerful way. And it would be for your glory, we ask this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Stand together as we sing. is found 
He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest tried and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter.
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living Lord hallelujah is the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope god you are my living For the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Up when I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. To look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. 
Christ my Savior and my God. Before the throne, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in Jesus, thank you for what the resurrection says, for what it speaks to. Thank you, Jesus, that you proved your power, that you proved that the cross was enough, it was sufficient, that you proved you have ultimate authority over all things, including death and the grave. And so, Lord, we go from this place celebrating in our hearts the truth and the power of the resurrection today. Lord, may we carry it with us as we go. Help us as we fellowship this afternoon and as church family to continue to worship through fellowship, just to continue to speak about you, to, to think upon you, to ponder you. Uh, help us, Lord, to be encouraged and to be an encouragement to others as we go about our different ways this week. In Jesus' name, we sing and pray and pray these things. Amen. You can be seated.